website such as this promulgate the common but preposterous apologetics that Islam is the most beautiful, tolerant and peaceful religion in the world. And because it is the fastest growing, this somehow implies it is the truth. Firstly, there is no connection between the growth of a religion and its truth claims. Secondly, nor does it mention the real reason for its growth, which is because Muslims have the highest birth rate compared to other religions, as mentioned by Pew Research, an organisation endorsed by Harvard University. Thirdly, as for the claim Islam is the most beautiful, peaceful and tolerant religion in the world, the veracity of this claim will be looked at in this video. Instead of peace and beauty, from its very beginning, Islam brought violence, destruction and mayhem. This includes from Muhammad's own lifetime, who himself killed people, promoted intolerance and terror, which will be shown shortly. Islam did not bring about peace. It did not even unite Muslims or make people less violent. If anything, the violence and intolerance increased. After his death in 632 AD, Muslims were still disunited, scheming, setting rival factions and groups. They were conquering, fighting and killing one another, including everyone else, at a faster rate than ever before. As an example of the internal disunity, at times they were interlapping and competing caliphates all vying for power at the same time. In reality, none of this should come as a surprise as they were only following the example of Muhammad and the Quran when it comes to violence and intolerance. Hence, this type of behaviour has evidently never stopped, which is an unfortunate byproduct of the religion despite the claims made by apologetics. If this is the behaviour of people Muhammad described as the best Muslims, what is to be expected of later Muslims? Muhammad committed much violence in his life. Just by way of a snapshot, he himself killed, as it says in Sunan Abu Dawud, the messenger of Allah was killing her people with the swords. The people he was killing were Jews, and the woman in question was later beheaded. This all happened under his leadership. Muhammad did not condemn any of this. In fact, he was not only complicit, but as the leader, chiefly responsible for the genocide. Given the size of the tribe of Banu Qurayza at the time, upwards to around 900 men were massacred in one day. They were beheaded before being thrown into trenches, according to At-Tabari. It gets worse, he killed children. Children who had just grown pubic hairs, which grows around the age of 11 years old. Even if the adults engaged in battle against him and did wrong, it is cruel and barbaric on another level to check innocent young boys for their pubic hair and then kill those who had just grown them. Here a very dangerous precedence was being set by Muhammad, which has now become a familiar tactic employed by modern Muslim terrorist groups, namely the indiscriminate killing of people whether they be men, women or children. So just as Muhammad killed indiscriminately, modern day terrorists justify their behaviour of killing women and children by citing Muhammad's very own actions. The reference to the use of catapults used to indiscriminately kill women and children occurred at the siege of Taif in the year 630 AD. Sahil Bukhari 3012 is another source terrorists often cite to justify their killing of women and children. On a side note, it says towards the end of the Hadith, quote, the institution of Hima is invalid except for Allah and his apostle, end quote. Hima is a reserved pasture where trees and grazing lands are protected from unchecked harvesting. As a practice, it existed before Islam but said to have been treated as a private reserve for powerful chieftains who used it as a tool of oppression. In this research paper, it says with the emergence of Islam, its function changed in that it is supposed to benefit the community rather than powerful individuals. 
but with Muhammad stating it is invalid except for him and Allah, all he did was to take it away from others and redirect its control all to himself. Muhammad attacked people without any provocation. For example, in a hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari 4357, it says he attacked a group of people only because they were pagans, and their house of worship rivaled the Kaaba in Mecca. In order to eliminate competition, the Muslims burned their place of worship. It goes on to say, unless they converted to Islam, their heads will be chopped off. So here is another tactic employed by the modern day so-called terrorists. So-called because they are actually only seemingly to do just as Muhammad did. The Hadith continues whereby the threat of forced conversions and killing ensued. Towards the end, Muhammad blessed the perpetrators of this massacre. This is hardly tolerant and peaceful behaviour. These are just a few examples of his behaviour whose example is seen by Muslims as the best of examples, as it says in Quran 33.21. So if this is the behaviour of Muhammad, whose emulation is mandated for all Muslims, then it is of no surprise what is seen amongst some followers of Islam today. Throughout history, similar violent, intolerant attitudes and behaviours have prevailed amongst the followers of Islam. The Quran promotes violence. It states clearly in 9.33 that Islam is to be made dominant and must prevail over all nations. This is precisely how Islam spread and is still the ideology of many Muslims as enshrined within Islamic teachings. It is only the so-called extremists who carry it out as their mission. Those Muslims who do not still tacitly approve of this as research after research shows. Therefore, they are just as culpable. In Quran 8.39, it says Muslims are to fight until there is no mischief and total obedience is to Allah. The word fitna translated here as mischief can be as mundane as an inconvenience or a distraction from the religion because a few verses earlier in Quran 8.28 it mentions how one's wealth and children can be a fitna, although this time the same Arabic word is translated as a test by the same website source. Evidence that Muhammad himself ordered and carried out atrocities to the point none but Muslims are to remain are numerous. Here are a few more. In Sunan Ibn Majah 71, he is quoted as saying how he will keep on fighting until none remain but Muslim. And in Sahih Muslim 523, Muhammad made the claim that he has been helped by terror. Therefore, the connection between violence, intolerance, terror and Islam is not coincidental. There is precedence and correlation both historically and scripturally. Its main scriptures advocates violence and intolerance. Precepts such as spreading terror is unambiguously mentioned even in the Quran, where it says in 8.12, Muslims are to instill terror into the hearts of disbelievers. The Arabic word translated as terror, rub, circled in red, indeed means terror, as confirmed by renowned Arab lexicographer Ibn al-Manzur, who in his famous dictionary, Lisan al-Arab, says rub means panic and fear. Other verses such as Quran 47.4 also mentions to behead the disbelievers in modern times, bombs and other attacks are used to cause panic, fear and terror, although they also use methods such as beheading, just as the Quran states, a fear tactic common amongst terrorists, whose claim is that they are only following the Quran and Muhammad. 
so they should not be labelled extremists or terrorists, rather just practising Muslims. Such is the preoccupation with violence, intolerance and conversion to Islam that Islam divides the world between those who are Muslim and those who are non-Muslim. The land or areas of Islam are called Dar al-Islam, abode of Islam, and non-Islamic lands or areas or countries as Dar al-Harb, abode of war. In other words, those areas where Islam has not been accepted yet, warfare against them can be imposed. This is an idea that early scholars attributed to Muhammad himself, who demanded nation leaders choose between conversion to Islam or war. This is the reason the founders of Sunni and Shia Islam's major schools of Islamic law accepted this concept, as did many classical Muslim scholars from many different denominations. This is how Islam grew and proliferated throughout the world and within history. This is how the Muslim majority countries in the world became Muslim majority countries, which has a correlation to the global Muslim numbers today, over 2 billion. Therefore, it is irrelevant if this concept is no longer practiced today or whether modern scholars or Muslims accepted it or not, some of whom do and others do not. For more information about the early Islamic legal theory, dividing the world into the two divisions of abode of Islam and abode of war is explained by distinguished academic, professor and doctor Majid Kaduri, who cites classical Muslim scholars and sources in his book, The Islamic Law of Nations. Given this backdrop, in the first 100 years of Islam, never seen before in the history of mankind since or after, on the one hand, in the westerly direction, Islam spread through to Europe, having conquered Spain, then to France, where Muslim invaders were finally defeated, and in the easterly direction to India and many countries in between. All this happened in a very short time. Notice India nor France had attacked Muslims. It was the Muslims who went on an aggressive conversion spree, meaning this rapid spread had nothing to do with the beauty of Islam that so many conquered people accepted it. In fact, the very opposite, other than the usual Islamic propaganda about how it spread by peaceful means, no serious academic, historian, genuine scholarship will say with any modicum of honesty that Islam spread through peaceful means to all these countries. Rather, it was spread by conquering, which entails violence, force and subjugation of indigenous people along the way, just as Muhammad did with the convert or die offer. Many modern Muslim terrorists who attack will say they're just carrying out and saying, just as Muhammad did and said. Based upon the evidence cited, it would not be a stretch to say Muhammad would probably agree with modern-day terrorists and their sympathisers more than the so-called liberal Muslims and their apologists. Islam spread because it is imperialistic. It does not recognise borders. The whole world is Allah's, as it says in Quran 7, 1 to 8. Believers are only deserving of it. So its aim is to spread Islam to all, whether they like it or not. In Sahih al-Bukhari 3167, Muhammad gave the Jews an ultimatum, either convert, otherwise they are not safe. They are to be expelled, as the whole world is Allah's and Muhammad's. Academic papers have been published about how Islam means surrender and how it should be imposed on people whether they like it or not an idea that contributes to the violence and terrorism witnessed through history until now. So when extremists say they want Islam to be everywhere, in every house and building, this is not too different from what Muhammad said as he does in this hadith, that Islam will enter every house in the world, and not believing in Islam is a disgrace. This is explained further by Yaqeen Institute as part of their Prophecy series. Quran 929 
is categorical about its subjugation and total domination to Islam. This is how it was understood by early Muslims, hence their conquering of lands and forceful conversions. It is still understood by Muslim extremists today in the same way when it says, quote, fight those who do not believe in Allah or in the last day and who do not consider unlawful what Allah and his messenger have made unlawful and who do not adopt the religion of truth from those who are given the scripture fight until they give the jizya tax willingly while they are humbled End quote. ibn kathir's commentary elucidates it is to fight all those who do not believe in islam just as muhammad did which includes jews and christians they are to be humiliated by being forced to pay a tax which is a sign of their disbelief and disgrace. This article, written by an academic, says, and it should come as no surprise, how terrorists use the Quran to justify their attacks. They quote Quranic passages such as the aforementioned 929, along with other Quranic verses, to justify their atrocities. The link is below. The point is, groups such as Al-Qaeda, ISIS, Taliban and other Muslims do indeed cite from the Quran and Muhammad's traditions as a justification for their terror and violence, including many Muslims around the world who are not directly affiliated with them. But they still agree with them. The only point of disagreement may be the methodology employed, but the principle remains the same in that it is Muslim world domination they seek. Others such as the apologists and the so-called liberal Muslims, at least only as a facade to the non-Muslim audience, would appear to disagree and argue that Islam's teachings are being distorted. The point still remains, distorted or not, methodology agreed or not, the general proposition is not invalidated as the actual Islamic sources themselves provide the impetus for the violent behaviour or the acceptance of their behaviour by others. And as long as that is the case, it cannot be said that the religion is completely exonerated from the behaviour of these individuals, extremists or not. In other words, the religion as taught by its proponents is responsible as it provides the predisposition or propensity for the violence. This can only happen if its teachings encourages and condones such actions. Unfortunately, it does as much as some may be in denial. As for the apologetics of Islam being a beautiful and peaceful religion, instead of the rhetoric, it is actions that speak louder than vacuous comments. This is where the actual truth is discerned. Not surprisingly, what is actually observed is the very opposite of the apologists' claims. According to the Institute for Economics and Peace, most of the deadliest terror groups claim to be Muslims. According to the Global Terrorism Index, nine out of the top ten countries for most terrorism-related activities are Muslim-dominated countries. Peace, tolerance and beauty is not observed when it comes to Islam and Muslims. What is observed is what it actually teaches, namely violence and intolerance. Due to the unending infighting, a precedent set by early Islam, many Muslims themselves fall victim to the violence and intolerance, so do not want to live in their countries anymore. Mass immigration ensues, the rich Muslim Gulf countries refuse to take them in, so they flee to non-Muslim Europe, America and elsewhere, who are given asylum, residence, financial benefits and a safe haven. Yet once there, violence, lack of integration, intolerance and extremism follows to the host country.
even those who do not engage in violence first hand there is tacit acceptance of violence by them often blaming the countries they live in such as the uk and us by justifying terrorist attacks against these countries many of the western values are antithetical to their own islamic values they see it as immoral and decadent yet they migrate to the west despite hating them even if they were born in western countries as first second or third generation children there is no loyalty as the hatred is still there but if the country is incompatible with islam surely they can move to one of the many muslim countries in the world rather because of the sense of divine right on their side and a false sense of superiority by virtue of being muslim what they seek is to force islam on others when their numbers are significantly large or surreptitiously if numbers are low whether the indigenous people like it or not after 9-11 a well-known muslim scholar hamza yusuf once stated to muslims if you hate the west emigrate to a muslim country However, they do not emigrate. In fact, the opposite is truer, as many more come in their droves. This emigration to non-Muslim lands goes against their own prophet, who advised Muslims not to live amongst non-Muslims, when he said, quote, I am not responsible for any Muslim who stays amongst polytheists, end quote. The website Islam Q&A explains the hadith further by stating it means if a Muslim is exposed to temptation as a result of living in a majority non-Muslim country, they should emigrate to a Muslim country. Rather conveniently, this part of Islamic teaching seems to go unheeded for many Muslims in the world who live in non-Muslim countries. So in conclusion, in the light of actual history and evidence, it cannot be said with any honesty that Islam is beautiful, tolerant or peaceful. This is just casuistry and poor apologetics because Muhammad advocated violence and intolerance. Even after Muhammad, Muslims were never united. They also advocated violence and intolerance, even amongst themselves and towards others. Islam spread to vast parts of the world within a short period by violence and intolerance. Within the first few hundred years, there were several competing Muslim caliphates and dynasties, again advocating violence and intolerance, infighting, killing one another and others. Muslim on Muslim killing is not a sign terrorism is not a part of Islam. It is the intolerant and violent teachings as found within its sources that have been put into action by their role models that causes this type of behaviour, which all indicates Islam is to be blamed. Violence and intolerance is ubiquitous amongst modern Muslims. Muslim countries are still some of the most violent and intolerant in the world. Wherever Muslims have migrated to, they have often denigrated the host society by bringing in violence, intolerance and terrorism. The common denominator again is Islam and Muslims. The point is, when Muslims are violent or have violent and intolerant inclinations, it is not an aberration of their faith. In fact, it is from the very core of their teachings as found in its sources, the Quran, Hadith, classical and even modern scholars because Muhammad and Allah promoted this type of behaviour. No amount of apologetics can hide the historical precedence of violence and intolerance, whether it be by their prophet, his companions, early Muslims, right up to modern times. Conversely, it is not an indicator that Islam is peaceful and violence is not a part of the religion if the majority of the world's Muslims do not engage in such actions therefore incorrectly implied that Islam is peaceful and tolerant. Firstly, this is only a facade as they tacitly agree which makes them just as guilty. Secondly, it can be argued these people are not acting according to their religion due to the shame of its content, embarrassed by what it says in their holy scriptures and the actions of their most 
holiest men they will try and explain it away with sophistry cherry-picking and apologetics an action that is no less shameful and abominable because no excuses should be made for these types of behavior but in some way it is to their credit that they seem more moral than their prophet and allah thirdly it is the so-called extremists and terrorists who unashamedly as they often do and claim are the true and real muslims because they are the ones who carry out the true teachings of their religion whereas the others are just hypocrites therefore the salient question is not whether islam is a religion of peace and tolerance quite clearly it is neither of these two things the pertinent question is whether muslims should see muhammad his companions and the quran as examples to follow sadly the answer to who does and who does not is evident the real miracle of islam and is a point of bewilderment is how so many muslims have come to believe muhammad and allah are the best examples when they are actually some of the worst such is the cognitive dissonance that they consider them as the most peaceful tolerant and the most moral agents when in fact they are the very opposite it is incredulous how they have managed to convince themselves that their religion is the most peaceful and tolerant when it is the very opposite of these things this is very plain for any unbiased fair observer having said this any criticism of islam tends to lead muslims to cry foul of islamophobia a word coined and created in modern times to mean hate against islam and muslims even if the criticism of the religion is justified done in a way to engage people to think and reflect done in a constructive and respectful manner only critiquing the ideology and its sources rather than any individual even then people are accused of islamophobia in reality it is done in an attempt to depict themselves as the victims and stifle any debate by trying to delegitimize criticism of their religion and open thinking what is then often followed is a barrage of insults and threats of violence such is the irony of the term islamophobia that the concept of hate is enshrined in the religion of islam itself which explains why it makes its followers acquire characteristics of hate violence and intolerance this will be explained in more detail in the next video